As I looked down at the center of Berlin, it looked as though a volcano had erupted. Hitler's once mighty Reich is strangled from the east, crushed from the west, obliterated from the sky. One felt a hideous sense of inferiority and desperation. January 1945. As Allied armies close in on Germany from the west, Russia readies an overwhelming attack from the east. More than two million men, 7,000 tanks, and 5,000 planes mass for the knockout blow against the battered armies of the Third Reich. While the Red Air Force gains strength, the Luftwaffe is desperate for pilots, planes, fuel. Adolf Galland senses impending disaster. The Russians were able to build a mighty air force. They were able to maintain a strong air force. They were able to rearm in an area outside the reach of the German Luftwaffe. And they had no shortage of fuel. Luftwaffe aces, once supremely confident, see their ranks decimated. Frederick Oblisser, Luftwaffe. We were so low on fuel that we positioned our planes for takeoff by having them pulled by oxen in order to save fuel. This meant that each mission had to be successful. Only the most experienced pilots were used for difficult missions, but then the experienced pilots also suffered greater casualties. From Leningrad to the Crimea, Soviet forces advance. The Red Air Force, reinforced with Air Cobras from America and powerful new Yak fighters, fills the sky with fire. We were able now to lend air support to our troops on the battlefield. Fedor Archipenko, Red Air Force. Domination in air power at that time then fully shifted toward the side of the Soviet Union. Air superiority was now completely ours. The Luftwaffe is forced to ration its remaining strength. Heinz Marquard, Luftwaffe. At the end of the war, the sorties became tougher from week to week due to the superiority of the enemy at that time. The pressure on us increased because our numbers decreased steadily and we received neither replacement aircraft nor replacement pilots. The Luftwaffe pilots desperately try to stem the Russian advance toward the Polish border. Considering the distances we had to cover, we were like a fire brigade, putting out fires. This meant being transferred every three to four days. We had tremendous logistical problems, so on a daily basis, we had to perform our missions and already think about the next airfield we were going to use. Faced with defeat, Luftwaffe pilots must call on reserves of inner strength to continue the fight. Soviet ground forces cross into Poland. The Red Air Force flies ground support missions to punish the broken Wehrmacht. Walter Krupinski, Luftwaffe. The Russian pilots were extremely good bomber pilots, that is, low-level attack pilots. In low-level flight formation, they would fly wing on wing very closely packed, 
providing us with a large target which we could strafe from side to side. But they could nonetheless maintain formation, carrying their rockets and bombs to the target. They were very brave, but they naturally suffered great losses. There were a lot of pilots who died. The shift to new equipment, to new planes, all this made us carry on a very difficult battle with the enemy. I have a total of 275 recognized victories, of which the majority were in the East. Am I proud of any special victory? I don't know this expression, proud. Naturally, every victory increased the sense of self-worth of every fighter pilot. It contributed to his experience. But one can't really talk of pride, because when you see what's left of your opponent on the ground, I think any emotion that there is would probably exclude the feeling of pride. By mid-January 1945, German defenses crumble outside Warsaw. Dietrich Rabach, Luftwaffe. And I saw then, how the... I saw German troops being surrounded. I saw German troops retreating before the Russians, which was something I had never seen before. And I saw the encirclement worsen. And eventually, I saw how the German troops were finally bombarded with rockets and artillery fire. Spring 1945. It is clear that the Russians cannot be stopped. As the Red Army advances from the east, Allied forces on the Western Front roll through German cities, blasted to rubble by incessant aerial bombardment. The Luftwaffe is Hitler's last hope for survival. Hitler commands his ground troops to fight to the death but he orders the cream of the Luftwaffe pulled back to defend the fatherland from heavy Allied bombing raids. We were taken out of our unit in Russia. I was brought to Germany. My mission was to combat the enemy escort fighters, not the bombers. When we uh, got uh, air superiority, uh, Man, we could, when they turned us loose to pursue after escorting the bombers, that's when the Luftwaffe bought the farm. My first impression as I flew my first sortie over Germany was, oh my God, look at all those targets. This is going to be a lot better than Russia. In Russia, you sometimes really had to search for an opponent. We had 15 fighter groups in the 8th Air Force, 15 fighter groups in the 9th Air Force. We could put up 50 airplanes in each group every day. So he figured out that's 1,500 fighters. There wasn't any place those guys could run and hide that we couldn't find them. In my first sortie, I shot down two Mustangs. In my second, a Thunderbolt. But then it was over. In my third sortie, I was the one who had to bail out. The noose tightens. The Red Army grinds toward Berlin. Allied forces pour across the Rhine. For the Third Reich, it is the countdown to doomsday. Hitler issues insane commands to phantom armies from his bunker in Berlin. And still, the Luftwaffe fights. In the hauptsächlich in der Schlussphase at the end of the war, the high command gave orders, which must have been issued by non-flyers. They expected one to accomplish the impossible, which we couldn't follow. For instance, a mission without the possibility of return. You wouldn't have had enough fuel to return to the German side of the front. 
Those orders were luckily refused by the squadron command. The Luftwaffe sends up hastily trained young pilots. They face seasoned veterans of the Battle of Britain. Brian Kingham, RAF. The German fighter pilots were getting shot down like flies, and most of them done about 10 hours flying. So for the last few months of the war, the opposition rarely melted away, with the exception of one or two old hands. There were a bunch of semi-trained young men being killed. Luftwaffe aces refused to quit, even in the face of chaos. We were a group of six fighters escorting the Dora 9. On our return leg, as those fighter bombers were about to land, they were attacked by enemy planes. I sent out four of my escorts to defend the airfield. The enemy didn't see us coming. They continued to fly in a very calm and relaxed manner. We also had the sun behind us. I gave the order to attack the enemy fighters simultaneously, and we attacked. Two of them went up in flames right away, and three of them somersaulted around in the air after they were hit. The other fighters, who didn't even expect this, all of them dove down. Immediately they went into a dive and left the bombers without protection, without any cover. My wingman and I attacked the enemy planes from underneath and came under fire. I was shot down, but I was able to save myself by bailing out. I celebrate that day as my birthday. Seeing your hometown reduced to rubble was motivation enough for us to fight. So we had only one mission, protect the homeland and the troops in retreat. They had unbelievable losses. Hitler concentrates what power he has left against the Russian juggernaut advancing on Berlin. To buy time, he demands that every German sacrifice his life for the Reich. It is carnage. Everyone knew perfectly well the war was lost. There was no more compromise solution. Our situation would not improve. And we were faced with unconditional surrender. That is the worst condition. And then came total destruction. April 1945, more than half a million Red Army troops. Thousands of tanks, 21,000 rocket launchers and 12,000 guns rip into Berlin's last defenses. The Red Air Force hunts down Luftwaffe bombers. I must say we really like those planes, those bombers. You could approach them easily because they had practically no ability to fire from the back. And now they had only one machine gunner left up there. And we were coming up around him. We let off a round of machine gun fire and they started burning. One went up in flames. The second one went up in flames. The third. The fourth. We shot down more than half of the enemy planes and lost only seven of our Soviet fighters. April 25th, 1945. Near the town of Torgau on the Elbe River, Soviet ground forces link up with American GIs. The mood is festive. April 26th, the Germans control an area of Berlin only 10 miles long and three miles deep. There we had very few flights because there was such a strong strike from the land forces and it was so fast. 
As a result, we flew only three or four missions, light missions, to escort our bombers, which were bombing Berlin. They were trying to destroy the main hotbeds of resistance in the city, where they were still fighting. The end of the war was foreseeable, that it must end in our defeat and capitulation. It made me sad to see us losing the war, but it was inevitable. As the hour of surrender approaches, Luftwaffe aces destroy their planes on the ground. The most frustrating experience for me was when we blew up our machines in 1945. We had to bid farewell to a lifestyle and to our comrades. And of course, we didn't know what the results would be historically and otherwise. German soldiers and airmen surrendered to American and British forces to avoid capture by the Russians. Group Captain Johnny Johnson is playing soccer when a German bomber crew lands at his airfield to give themselves up. And I think they were quite astounded when they saw the group captain dressed up in a pair of football shorts and looking rather uh, scruffy. And anyway, the chap eventually saluted me and said he was bombed up and uh, would like a Spitfire escort. Uh, and then we could all go off together and uh, attack the Russians to the east of Berlin. Uh, so uh, we helped him on his way to the prison war camp. Eric Hartman, with 352 kills and known as the Black Devil of the Eastern Front, has special reason to fear the advancing Russians. He surrenders to an American officer. The American gave his word of honor that no German would be handed over to the Russians. But in a few days, we were told that we were going to drive to Munich. We went south, and then suddenly we turned east and drove into a forest and arrived at a Russian outpost. So the whole column was stopped and handed over to the Russians. And this is how I wound up in Russian captivity. Hartman is fated to spend 10 years in a Soviet prison. He is one of the lucky ones. He will return home alive. April 30th, 1945. Russian troops battled to the doorstep of the Reichstag. May 2nd, 1945, Berlin surrenders. Arseniy Vorozhikin enters the city on foot. We had to pick and make our way through the corpses of those German soldiers. I wouldn't even call them soldiers. They were mostly kids, children dressed in SS uniforms and old men. And so, as we were coming up to the Imperial Chancellery, we saw the eagle lying there. It was a two-meter-long bronze eagle. For more than 12 years, it had soared over the Imperial Chancellery, and the whole world shuddered as a result of that eagle. Our soldiers came and threw it down. And there it was now, under our feet, that eagle, a smashed lump on the ground. May 7th, 1945. Germany signs an unconditional surrender. Sergei Dolgushin, Red Air Force. My chief of staff came up and said, Commander, we've had a coded telegram from headquarters. They say, until special orders, stop all flights. So I looked at them and said, Okay, kids, it's the end of the war. As to what I felt, I can tell you, I simply couldn't, I couldn't move. I couldn't move my arms or my legs. I was a 24-year-old kid. I was used to combat. I wasn't particularly weak. Here, I just couldn't do anything. I just simply lay down flat under the wing, and the mechanic put a parachute under my head.
As I lay there, I saw a vision of the horrible battles from the 22nd of June when the war began. I remembered all those kids who might never see again, with whom might never be able to have a toast together for victory. It all raced through my mind. there was a general feeling of exultation, of triumph, victory for which we had been waiting for nearly four years and for which we paid much too heavy a price. World War II is the costliest conflict in human history. In Germany, four and a half million dead. Half a million Britons, dead. 300,000 Americans, dead. 20 million Russians, dead. More than 13 million civilians, dead. So many unknown, dead. So many heroes, known and unknown. 